Um, so we, uh, a number of years ago, had a uh, Sarah Grant to look at marketing some less common fruits um, in our permaculture farms. And we were at uh, the sort of slightly past beginning stage of our farms um, and looking to scale up, looking to move into aronia, looking at uh, honeyberry, Saskatoon or Juneberry as, it, as it's called, uh, elderberry and currants. And looking to figure out how we could market our fruit that would be reflective of the work that we put into it um, and um, uh, see if we could scale up those crops. Uh, because, as you know, perennialization um, is, is a really helpful aspect of farming. Uh, it can help with um, resilience on uh, floods and droughts. Um, it is resilient to climate change. It works really well integrated with other markets that we have. So that was our gist. I'm going to highlight some of the findings of that grant just to revi uh, revisit that and then um, talk about my farm specifically and where I've gone with the findings of that grant. And then my colleagues are going to also talk about their farms. So the mechanism of our grant was to do some field assessments of our farms, three different places, three different markets, um, look at how we were producing from a forest garden perspective. We did some surveys online and in print. We did tastings with our respective customer bases. We did some field days. And we also did some secondary market research, just looking at the price point for fruit um, at that time. And that was, again, 2013 we started. <laughs> um, and uh, then we also worked on uh, a calculator uh, and a decision-making tool um, coming out of the grant in terms of ad, uh, getting started or wanting to invest in these fruits, how much was it going to take to get these fruits started, how long till return on investment, uh, what was the labor involved. Um, we poured all of that data into um, the University of Wisconsin's project now, which is a fruit and nut compass decision-making tool. Uh, if you're not familiar with the compass series from you know, the UW, it's a decision-making tool. They have one for vegetables, um, and they've been working on a fruit and nut one as well. Um, that's proving to be a little bit more complicated, so they're still working on it. Uh, but um, some initial information about that is in the grant report, and then we have um, spreadsheets we can share with you, um, and probably updates to those numbers um, in our presentation. We really emphasize combining learning with celebration. So uh, Erin had a current events uh, celebration on her farm, which she repeated for a couple of years. I thought that was a fabulous idea, and borrowed it, and did this a similar thing. Um, and that proved a great way to have people connect with the farm and what I was doing um, on a perennial basis. We looked at eater habits. Um, and for the three of us, our eaters were mostly buying from co-ops and farmers markets, um, as opposed to um, in an online store or, um, I guess, not backyard supermarkets. Um, and the most important thing that they were buying for was taste, um, if it was local, and what the nutritional content was. So thinking about market messaging, then we could emphasize um, what the fruit tasted like. We could have samples out uh, if we were at the farmer's market. We could add samples of up and coming crops to our CSA box uh, to have people try and give feedback. Um, and then emphasizing the antioxidant value of so many of these fruits, emphasizing the high nutrient value um, was important in our marketing. Um, and then we could also talk about our growing pra practices, what we were doing on our farms uh, that made us sustainable. Uh, people talked about uh, not knowing what the fruit was when they saw it on our market stands, um, and the fact that it just wasn't widely accessible. And so, um, We'll each talk about how we've taken and run with that idea. Um, the main uh, interesting fact on the um, income side was that, in general, before people were educated about these fruits, they would pay. They said they would pay five dollars per pint, uh, which doesn't really cover your labor if you're picking currants or uh, Juneberries or elderberries. Uh, but with education and testing uh, or, or tasting they said they would go up to $7 per pint, and that has pretty much borne out 
um, at the farmer's market uh, where I'm at, I'm actually charging $8 per pint. I don't sell it by the pint. Mm -hmm. People are better at understanding the dollar value than the volume, and so I sell half pints for $4, and nobody has any questions about that. Um, and I'm not in an economically um, thriving area uh, up in northern Wisconsin. So that was good, important to know. Uh, but in general, fruit offers a uh, better profitability per labor uh, than vegetables. Um, uh, it does have some time to get established, um, and it gives us a bigger access to different markets across the board. People will buy fruit from my farmer's market stand in the crappiest weather, um, and they might not have bought vegetables if I didn't have fruit on the table. Uh, so they'll stop at my stand because I have some interesting fruits, and they, they've come to know that I have interesting fruits at almost every point in the summer. And um, that allows my vegetable sales to increase at the farmer's market. Um, we um, engaged about 700 people in our tastings and surveys, um, and you know, did really spent a, a fair amount of time collecting data. And so um, that's something to think about if this is new in your own area, um, spending, planning to spend a little bit of time on research and development and also marketing. Uh, and having recipes for people is, is obviously, uh, was obviously really important. <coughs> um, and other ways to use it, having samples of the cooked thing um, that, they, that, that people could try. Uh, especially in the early market, uh, again, that was a huge hit. Uh, we made a, um, a berry, I forget now what it was, but it was a berry salsa that went on top of my hard-boiled eggs and a slice of cold bacon. Um, uh, uh, and, and so I could demonstrate all those products and people were like, salsa made with berries, we never thought of that. So, you know, you can get really creative um, and, and stack a couple functions there. Um, and then um, think about, you know, this, this can be a pretty big upfront investment, but the payoff can be pretty nice. Uh, and so where do you want to spend your time um, overall in your marketing, or in your um, um, enterprise uh, budgets? So this is my farm. I'm up, I'm up on the tip of uh, Wisconsin on the shore of Lake Superior. Um, I am in the middle of nowhere. I'm 500 miles from Chicago. 200 miles from Minneapolis, Duluth is 50 miles away. Uh, there's, a, there's a regional population of about 30,000 people here, and we are two of the most economically depressed counties in the state of Wisconsin. So uh, this, is not, um, this is not an urban market for me by any means. Uh, this is the breakdown of my farm. Um, I get most of my income from CSAs winter and summer. Uh, I have a quarter acre market garden, and then the rest of my farm is in production permaculture. So I have five acres of pretty intensively planted market or uh, forest garden. Um, and you can see I highlighted my farmers markets number there. That's really low and not really worth my time. Uh, but it is a huge way to market my CSAs, and that's the area that I was targeting as we thought about fruit development. Uh, if I can have more fruit at the market, it's w way worth my time to go, and um, uh, that number could go up by quite a bit since I don't really want to drop that presence just yet. Um, so I'm sold out of fruit by 9 in the morning at the farmer's market, so mm -hmm. I, could, I could easily quadruple the fruit that I brought, um, and, and that number would go up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I are, yeah, I'm you. just curious, are these your mar numbers for like, 2019? This was last year's numbers. Okay. Yeah. Not from when we did this. Not from when we did this. Uh, yeah. Um, and that's only the gross. That's gross. Yeah. So half of that goes back right back into the farm. Um, and then I have some off farm uh, income that um, I'm, I'm editing an academic journal. Uh, I'm, do, I'm doing small amounts of guest teaching and adjuncting. Um, and I'm, I live pretty mean. Yeah. How many uh, vendors at the farmer's market? There's about. 12, t uh, 7 to 12 vendors at the farmer's market, and that's, the, the market that I go to is a population, the city is 8,000 people, so right. it's tiny. It's, yeah, yeah that's about going, like mine, and yeah. I, I, I go to mine about the same amount of yeah. income, and I look at it as outreach and education. It is, it very much is. It's my yeah. community service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't put a dollar value to the pork that I have in the system, uh, but I want to just bring it up here that it is an important part of my markets now. It's just that it's a moving target because that's a fairly new enterprise for me. 
Um, in terms of permaculture design, just to show you how my farm is laid out, um, the house and some of the um, more tender things are located right uh, nearby. Um, I initially had all my honeyberry plantings there so I could track uh, what was a very new crop for me. Um, and that's been helpful because uh, otherwise I would have missed the fact that the, <laughs> the early crops were completely eaten by cedar waxwings and uh, more recently they're pretty much devoured by robins. And so uh, got to get on those fruits right away. Um, zone two <laughs> is my market gardens. Again, I have about a quarter acre of market gardens, uh, really intensively planted. Um, and then greenhouse, uh, hoop house space, excuse me. My winter greenhouse is attached to my house. Um, and then zone three is um, all of the um, uh, orchard and understory shrubs. Um, and I'll talk about how that's, how I'm using that. Just uh, some images of what that looks like in real life. So uh, the overstory trees that I have on my farm are apples, cherries, pears, Korean nut pine, and then burns <coughs> one white oak. Um, in, and the understory is basically every rest, every berry that can grow in my zone, I'm, I've tried out. So one of the outcomes of this grant for me was I can replicate this same project with, that we had with, with currants and elderberries and juneberries and such um, with some of the other lesser known fruits like aronia um, and cornelian cherry and highbush cranberry. Um, and do that same sort of education with people and recipe testing, um, and then have an even further diversity of fruit on my farm. And because I mostly market through CSAs and farmers markets, those are perfect markets to have a smaller quantity of a really diverse um, set of products from a, from a very diverse landscape. Um, and then in the understory now, I've also got herbs, uh, which I sell whole, uh, to wholesale to since I'm dropping off at restaurants and coffee shops, all the my CSA boxes, why not bring them $10 of mint every week too? Um, which, um, you know, can at least pay for my gas adding up um, over the season. Um, so that's how I've scaled up from the pilot project that we had uh, from the SARE grant. Uh, I wanted to show how this breaks down in terms of harvest times and thus cash flow. Um, so our grant was currants, elderberries, honeyberries, and Saskatoon are otherwise known as juneberries. Um, initially, we found that the honeyberries, I, I think you'd agree with this, yeah. just didn't really do a whole lot for us. This was right when honeyberries were becoming a thing. They were very expensive plants. The fruit wasn't that great. Um, and for us, they really weren't producing very much in the time span of the grant. Uh, since then, um, the plants have kicked in uh, on my farm. And, and so it took uh, like five to seven years for the wow. fruit to really get going. I heard, I heard you talking smack, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at them out like, like you I mean, going. This happened with my apples, too. I was talking smack, and they, they all suddenly produced. Um, but uh, it, honeyberries turned out to be a really important crop at an early season when I didn't otherwise have a lot of fruit. Um, and they, they, because I'm in a super cold area, they precede all of the spotted wicked drosophila insect problem that can show up later with soft fruits. My philosophy on my farm is it has to sort itself out ecologically. Other, mm -hmm. and, 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 and so um, I have uh, planted in small uh, patches. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, raspberries. My raspberry rows are 30 feet long and I have them spread out all over the farm. Um, and there'll be some pictures later of, of some places where I have them. So I'm using them in, for different purposes as well as just being a row of raspberries. Um, and so uh, if spotted wing, wingus drosophila really takes out my Bristol blacks, uh, it doesn't seem to migrate over then to my um, uh, 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 encore uh, or my later berries. Um, it, there's so many birds, songbirds on my farm, uh, I think they actually do make an impact. I haven't tested that. Um, but um, I have such a diverse landscape. You know, I don't have a half acre of raspberries or half acre of strawberries. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's really helping. And I think it's also helping uh, because they're um, temperature dependent, the, the Drosophila is temperature dependent. I live in a frost pocket. Mm -hmm. um, and Lake Superior is to the northwest. And um, I've got a ridge to the southeast of me. So, I'm getting all the western wind off of Lake Superior, and so my um, apple trees are not even blooming until the middle of June. 
Um, and so it pushes back the timeline on the Drosophila. Uh, but, so if, if I can stretch the harvest times for each fruit, um, that can stretch out my market. Um, and because the fruit is in such demand, um, that, can, that, can, that can hugely impact my bottom line. I'm looking at varietal differences. Um, so after the grant that we had to, to say that, yeah, the markets would bear some expansion, now I can go back in and trial a whole bunch more varieties of different kinds of fruits and stretch out the harvest time. So my raspberries start in um, mid-July and run through um, the end of August, uh, if not September. Um, and my strawberry season now is expanded uh, because I have a winter greenhouse, and so after the plants are out of there, I can have strawberries in there, um, and I get them a month earlier than they would be outside, and they have no pests either. Um, so uh, the other thing that has happened for me since the SARE grant was uh, really incorporating more animals in my system. Um, and uh, for me, that means um, American <coughs> guinea hogs. Uh, this is a small breed of pig. Um, they do not bother shrubs or trees. Hmm. And so they have completely changed my ability to have a diverse um, forest garden uh, because uh, I can plant all of these things together. They're out there until June 15th uh, mowing everything. Um, my uh, need to mow then in the orchard goes way down, uh, which means I can harbor all kinds of brown nesting birds. Um, the fertility is, is uh, matched to the uh, trees and shrubs needs. Uh, I get bacon. Um, <laughs> they're a blast. Um, and so that's really allowed me to look at even more plantings because I don't have to be concerned with how am I going to weed those raspberries um, uh, in a tough clay loam sodded soil. <laughs> I, don't, I don't worry about that anymore because between the pigs and the chickens, they, they take care of it. Are your pigs seasonal or do you keep them year round? I keep them year round. I have a, a breeding herd because it's an endangered breed. Um, and so they move um, around in, in the orchard. They're in the orchards in the winter up until June 15th. Uh, they usually, for the pear overstory orchard, they're, they're in there in October. For the apple overstory orchard, they go in in November after I'm picking out the last apples. And then they're in there until June 15th. So they're outside. They're out oh, yeah, they're outside. The no cover. Uh, they have, um, I have <laughs> covered, uh, let's see if I have a picture, no. Um, I have uh, truck toppers, so they're short animals. So they fit in truck <coughs> toppers with a fun cinder box, um, but yeah. they don't want to be in there, uh, as it turns out. Um, and they use that as a glorified latrine. Oh. Um, and so they would prefer to bear burrow into round bales um, in the wintertime, so I provide them round bales. Um, but they, they want to be outside. Yeah. So this is what it looks like just with um, some continual mowing of the animals. Um, this is um, uh, where my chicken tractor, uh, uh, where my chickens have been. So I feed them in the drip line of the trees. They're mowing that down. Um, and then um, uh, later on in the fall, the, the pigs are going to be in there and they're, they've got this great grass to be in. Learning how to graft and cut, to take your own uh, cuttings um, and you can set up on Oh, here, okay. um, is really helpful. So after we had the SARE grant, we piloted um, some uh, taste testings. Then I could scale up on the varietals. Then um, uh, if, if I decide that these five out of the 20 that I planted are really good, um, I can take cuttings from my existing plantings and plant those out and, and save a, a fair amount of money scaling up. Um, and I don't know if you just, I was just, I brought the Fedco tree catalog with me as bedtime reading. And, you know, uh, an apple tree is $30 a tree now. And um, so it's worth it to know how to um, do this kind of work. Too. I'm a little more willing than Claire is to like fight uh, pests and diseases to make something work, but not totally willing. So finding disease resistance um, is, a really, is, a, is a big priority for us too. Um, yeah, and I guess I didn't talk too much about it. We do still grow elderberry, neronia, and Jim Saskatoon service berries. Um, I, they're not a big part of our, of our marketing, um, although you know, every year I kind of like do some experimenting with them and haven't, haven't hit on something that makes them, um, makes them a, a big money for us yet. So, so waiting for that. And, um, 
yeah, I also put in, none of these pictures are ours, uh, but they're animals in the orchard are a great idea. I'll talk more about it. This is a little bit about how, to, how we learn to do what we do, a lot of which is the, the big thing for us was really planting in phases, so starting slowly, learning as we went, and then figuring out what would call for us. I'm Erin again. Um, I co-own Hilltop Community Farm, and probably about midway between La Crosse and Madison. We're in the right on the eastern edge of the Driftless region, um, in this area that hasn't been, you know, kind of defined by like hills, old soils, and rivers. Um, it, like missed the last glaciation. Um, so we also have a lot of terrain we're dealing with. When I say we, my my um, my husband um, Rob McClure is the other co-owner. He's been doing a vegetable CSA since 1993, and we're really pretty small scale. We feed six families and ourselves through the veggie CSA. And when I came on the Mary Band in about 2007-08, um, we were sort of making head to make, you know, it was a good decision point. Like, we're, here's another person, what can the land support? What do we have time and energy for? We also, like, similar to Rachel, we work off farm and live in Madison. Um, the farm is in, like, Laval. We're kind of splitting our time between urban and rural. So we also, that's kind of in our market space too. All right, so this was also brought up a lot on the production side, but what, um, so our farm, we, you know, fruit's about, we grow fruit on just under an acre. Um, it's always been part of our existing vegetable CSA. We've grown raspberries, apples, hardy kiwi, and we were, um, like with Claire and Rachel with this grant, we were like, well, okay, so we know fruit's a great niche for us. So how do we grow more of it, and what do you, how do we help, what's the best fit for for um, different berries and to expand that. Um, but I bring it back to this, because this, you know, for us, like October, okay, we're, we're ready to put our feet up against the wall. And, <laughs> but we, I think in all cases, we like to start and end each season and with like land gratitude, right? Or just like that, starting with the soil and soil being you know, a reflection of, of our, you know, what we eat and kind of how energy is moving through the system, right? And our own bodies as well. So, I think it's a good time. I was like, oh, you know, go back and just be like, thank you, fruit trees. I say that because for fruit, especially, you know, Claire brought up food forest. Um, you know, you're sort of thinking like, okay, you're you're holding in the soil like year round, etc. I'm kind of um, rambling right now, but let me bring it back to thinking like a fruit forest. And, um, with fruit, you're in it for the long haul, whether it's berries or trees. But at the same time, there's like a lot of like immediate disruption, which is kind of a weird paradox. Um, but just like we're all designing our farms in some way with diversity in mind, occupying different different niches in the can, you know, in the field side, but also with our markets. And I bring that up because it's kind of this complementary function and creating networks of mutual support. So you can think. So for us, we've like, oh, well, this can translate into marketing, right? So we know what we want. We want it high yielding, grower friendly, exceptionally nutritious. We're curious. We're curious people. So how much time and energy do we have? We're not there 100% of the time. Animals don't necessarily work, except um, wildlife. <laughs> woodchucks, yes. Um, <laughs> had to bring in the woodchucks. So. <laughs> um, so you know, we, we're, we're on sloping lands. We're not very mechanized. We're really we're doing a lot of things by hand. So those all things like kind of went into our decision about what to, what to do with fruit. Um, and we were going to experiment from there and ask people. What is it about being around fruit for us? So from a market standpoint, um, we're, out, we're, we're marketing direct. We had an existing CSA. We wanted to add, expand the palette of possibilities with fruit. So it's, I, I'm like, it's fun to hear where you all are at now a little bit because <laughs> we were like, <laughs> so for a long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. But it, what, a, what an invaluable thing to be like to come back and share like, um, here's what we thought and here's what's happening. What's happening? And like, you know, and that's part of the, the Sarah thing, like they really support like, you know, like some risk, shared risk taking and then we can also share that information and it just kind of multiplies out from there. So we, you know, we're like, well, we, we know CSA. That's what we do. Like, what if we had a fruit CSA? Like, wow. And I'm like, so glad you're making it work because we could not make the fruit CSA work. But that's okay. We, we sort of came up with a hybrid. We started out with like playing with fruit puns. They're endless. We, had, we started our own um, currency system. We're like, okay, money is a tool, right? Like you can have your own local currency, right? So why not have a fruit currency on our farm? And that was, so we did. Um, we gave people fruit bucks who wanted to come in and they spent them throughout the season. And, and then we learned like what people's preferences are. And then also for us, like, well, this is a lot of work. We're not like <laughs> ready to manage all that. So we weren't really set up for that. 
but it was good to learn along the way and because I, you know again I think what came out of that is the expectations of your customers too and they're like you know wanting they see volume they don't necessarily um, translate the volume to the value in terms of, of like you know your time and effort when you're pricing so that was a um, so what we kind of came up with was a, was a hybrid from there we have two fruit market shares and you know you, along the way you find who your current lovers are and like who's like oh, okay sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's fruit current, current right you yes <laughs> maybe you find other current lovers though. um so we started from there like but then we also like we have we've had good luck with restaurants um i think uh and especially in the Madison area, for us, like a lot of people have gotten really sophisticated with the bar menu, and these berries work really well for the mixology piece. Because we're pretty small scale, we're not giving huge volumes, and they're willing to like work with that. Um, and so it's been, you know, I think how we sort of navigated, we just lost one of our favorite um, chefs because she's moving to Portland. <laughs> but with that, what we try to do is like just like come up with a meeting with the staff or the restaurant like on the front end of the year and be like, here's what we're hoping for, what what worked, what didn't, what can we do more of or not. So that's sort of how we navigated that a little bit. But that's berries render themselves really well to mixology and also the flowers. Um, but, I about but you know, you should be able to discover. So you can grow it now. What, right? Um, Let's see. What we've also discovered, I have a slide about emergence and to where we started and where we are now and what's kind of come out of that. So um, having a market for seconds has been instrumental or just knowing what we want to do with that. We also don't really like, um, we, we market under, we'll do some like jam making, yes, or we're just like, thinking in mind that you're going to have seconds and you're going to need an outlet for that or like some kind of processing. Or even if you don't have seconds, like one, this is, okay, minor tangent. <coughs> But aronia berry, how many of you are familiar with aronia? Oh, yeah. I see some labs. Oh, <laughs> it's an amazing fruit. Like, oh, look at this color. Man. It's intense. It's pretty. <laughs> Putting aronia in a CSA box is a really great way to find out if your members read their newsletter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I remember being at a specialty fruit marketing, or like, um, like in Illinois, the, co the conference there, and then there was yeah. Tara Brockman, I think, who was it? She has a farm, and she was doing like two acres of Aronia. Oh. And she was, I know, and you're oh. like, yeah, whoa. <laughs> but one thing she, but her plan though was to do mostly seconds to juices, and there's a definite yeah. interest there. But what, even at two acres, she had a hard time finding the custom yes. people to do juicing, yeah. et cetera. But I, for, even for us, like, I'm like, oh, that'll never be us. We have only 60 plants. <laughs> this year was a purple haze of aronia and we went back to the chefs who usually buy things from us and they're like we still have the stuff sitting in vodka from last year we can't get the t we gotta it's gotta age so yeah. so we did have a glut but what's come along the way um and for those of you you know the stacking functions piece i'm also a flower farmer like actually that's where i get most of my cash income yeah. from the farm yeah. um that that's really but that's aronia is a beautiful like if you're thinking of woody perennials and to differentiate yourself so you're out there pruning anyway right or you're posting <coughs> the buds it's like an amazing like florist niche like people to work with it whether for your own self or for other um so that's one thing to think about mm -hmm. as well or putting like fruits in bouquets it's like a really been a fun design outlet so so I do think like growing fruits also have a place in other types of market opportunities that we discovered as a result of this grant. And it goes back to the value of beauty and stacking functions and finding something that really works for you and your time and energy. Um, so does the Aroni make wine? Because that would be one mm -hmm. gorgeous glass Yeah, of there wine. are some mm -hmm. people doing that. Oh, and, um, I, that's a great, green. you know. It's really high in tannins. Um, is that good or bad? Mm -hmm. Good. I mean, it's, you know, oh, wine is good with tannins. Yeah. Yeah. We added it to hard cider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that if you're willing, I'm not a winemaker, and I'm not. We don't. Rob and I both realized on this grant as well. It was like we don't want to spend most of our time doing value added, like you know, and also like Rachel, mm -hmm. and we're not. We want to be outside, but we along the way we have discovered, you know, connected with like mostly um, chefs, but then a few of our customers who like to make like do their own home canning or get batches. But, but sometimes maybe there is like a relationship you could, that's out there that if you wanted to scale it up or be like a boutique winemaking piece that people are, you know, I think that's a good niche to exploit <laughs> if you want, if it works for you. Um, what else about emergence? Um, oh, one thing in the current realm, 
clove currants were a new discovery as well. We're like, we're like, just because we wanted to keep harvesting currants. <laughs> so clove currants come up a little bit later in um, Ribes odoratum is a, is a species name. They'll kind of come right after your black currants. So if you're thinking of sequencing as well, and they don't have that kind of meaty, nutty aftertaste that black currants do, um, but they're very similar in, in like habit. Um, um, other things that have also come up and that was not planned again is is maybe you're into like one beautiful thing about fruit, right? It's like you like it's willingness to like divide and transplant, transplant, mm -hmm. and the amazing thing you can do to part propagating. And so we've started to find people that you know like it, like for plants, or that's something we do for when we mentor farmers, like some beginning fruit farmers. We'll like give them their starter kit. We got the idea from Claire. Claire and I trade back and forth all the time with plants. So it's just very much this life-giving thing that you're starting out on with, with perennials. And that's been really cool to see. And you can hone in new school, um, tools around grafting. Stuff does get expensive. People are like, we'll call you up and come out of the woodwork. Um, and ways. you can fund your plant purchase by selling offshoots the next year at farmer's market, as long as it's not patent protected or something like that. Okay, so that one was I wanted to say. You caught it? Okay. Oops. Oops. Let's go back. And then, just when you think <laughs> you've worked so hard, like from the last five, I mean, five years, and then, you know, you mentioned a little bit of like frost and upheaval and climate change. That, like, so even with fruit, something that's like going to outlast our lifetime, especially with the tree part, right? We still have to deal with like impermanence and like the perennial paradox. So we used to pride ourselves. I still kind of do, like, you know, like, oh, all the fruit is sold before I'm picking any of that. Ah, <sighs> okay. <laughs> then, <laughs> then I was like, oh, crap. Managing anticipation and disappointment in that space because, like, with, you know, you're ready to go harvest, like, some red currants and had a similar thing with Claire on her farm as well. Like, you know, the next day you're ready to pick and then they're all gone. You're like, what just happened? <laughs> and you have to then go back and tell people that, all like, well, the birds ate everything. And most people, I find that our um, chefs are just, Client, you know, members as well are really, people are pretty forgiving, but it's, internally it's really hard to kind of like feel, I don't know, just navigating your own personal disappointment, which will happen. Um, and the picture up there with the little butt out of, like, so it's not part of, it wasn't part of the grant, but it was in our, we, we grew up, I, I don't know if I should say past or present, because we, we have a lot of quince, and we have a lot of quince in our orchard, and it's an amazing fruit, um, it still is. But this last winter, we lost all of them except for two. We thought they were all dead, and I cried. And I'm like, no, because we worked so hard to build on your market, and then we were getting people just, you know, you know, there's a lot of good storytelling and like some of these fruits, the connections they have to like, you know, home and what home was and immigrant stories, and then you just really get that good connection with your clients. And they're people from like, New Jersey to Wyoming were like, do you have clients? And like, wow, you're like, yeah, we should. We, you know, and they were like, 300 pounds a tree. Oh my gosh, you know. And then I'm like, <laughs> all right, wait five years. <laughs> or you know, or just that heartache that can come with that, navigating the impermanence of it all. So I don't I bring this slide up for a reason. Um, maybe it's just a you um, it's like on a personal level to be able to navigate your balance, your personal commitments or like managing commitments and sales. It's been a little bit of dance. I think this grant really helped us in and being like, oh, well, there's a sweet spot between what I know I can um, sell and what I might actually have, and just to like be on more of the conservative end rather than just be like, yeah, I'll bring it. You know. <laughs> what happened to your quince? Oh, they all died except for from winter, winter kill, freezing. Winter kill. Yeah. So, but the, you know, I don't know. They started budding out from their trunk. Yeah. So maybe maybe they're still alive. I have to, this was just this year. I don't know. Maybe I will next year like discover that. But but you know, in the spirit of like renewal, like they're going to be a little like trellising system for some mm -hmm. vines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I don't know. And to go back, another big criteria again of our grant was just um, the combining learning and celebration. I think all of us have done events or open houses. We used to do like a, current events for us was a great way to like kind of balance the grower and the eater expectations. We had a couple chefs come out and we did the tastings and we had a band and it was all day. It was great. And then now Rob and I are like, oh, we can't handle all day affairs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> back. Ah, so we had, we scaled back a little bit on that and just like, like we have an orchard happy hour, like come out for a tour. Let's just enjoy and share some fruit and good conversation. And if you have a bar customer or mixologist or someone likes to fruit forage, it's a great way to play with stuff. 
And what we also discovered is people just want to come out to the farm and chill out. So that was a good thing to notice too. Yes, Denise. Not many people talk about pears. Oh, you go. I you can go. talk about pears. I can too. So you all right, you go first. Okay. We all grow pears. We, we all grow, grow pears. pears. Not <laughs> part of the grant. You grow pears for your heirs. Not to the grant. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, we do have some pears. Uh, it got was part of you know uh, we've always had them on the farm. We put them in our CSA and to restaurants mostly. Um, they work pretty well for our, for our farm. Um, we mostly we claps favorites some beer schmitz. Ayers is really beautiful. Um, kind of find a very little disease pressure on our end. We don't have animals in the mix. I mentioned that too. So we're also pretty like not committed to doing like we got to get our curculio down. <laughs> we have plums as well. So that's how I say about here. What about for you? Like? I was trying to get my slide there. Oh yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. I have um, about 100 pear trees. Um, planted uh -huh. them. Uh, it was one of the first things I did on um, the farm because I knew they would take forever, and, and, and they did take forever. It's been about 12 years of them in the ground. I had my first commercial crop this year. Wow. Wow. So, you know, we had, yeah. so we, had, we had a couple, um, you know, over the last couple years, uh, a couple trees fruiting. Um, a couple things to know about them. So um, they, uh, pollinators don't like them as much as apples. And so um, they're harder to pollinate. Um, and what I've come to is um, as I have space in the pear uh, orchard, I'm going to be adding in um, um, crab apples because my best pear pollination is actually on the edge of the apple orchard. Uh, they're, they're, they're not mixing the pollen, but the bees are present. Um, and so um, that's important. Pears are also tricky because you need to get the right pollinator for the right pollen, yeah, other tree. Um, and and um, there's some, it's not so straightforward there, but there's lots of good resources with the Tree Fruit Growers Network. And Rachel right here, maybe? Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> As um, yeah. person. Oh. <laughs> Glasses. Um, I have um, varieties, I, I was looking for varieties that would ripen after my, um, cherries and before my apples. Uh, there wasn't a lot written about ripening time for northern Wisconsin. In fact, there was nothing written about that. And so I went with Maine um, dates, or uh, excuse me, Vermont, I think it was Vermont dates, which turned out to be not quite right. Uh, so my pears ripen uh, most of September, um, going into October a little bit. I was hoping for August. Um, and I've got Hudar Ayers Summer Crisp, um, Patton, Manning, Miller, Luscious, uh, Suckle, and what's another one? And, and uh, No, I don't have that one yet. Ayers? I said Ayers, yeah. Um, so uh, again, looking, looking for, as a solo farmer, I'm looking for what can I harvest in smaller batches over a longer period of time. Uh, did that with my apples too. And one, dwarf? Uh, nope, standard. So standard. one challenge with pears is that there are not any really good, really truly dwarfing pear rootstocks the way there are with apples, which means it's harder to control the size and it's also harder to find um, things to get them to, to bear earlier, right? Because you get apples to bear earlier by planting them on dwarf or semi-dwarf stocks and that's right. not very much an option with pears. Uh, there's a lot of research that goes on in that, which is great and there hasn't been super clear winner results with any of it that I'm aware of. Um, there are some, like, I would say there's a couple of varieties that are a little bit more, like, naturally precocious that we've had luck with. Mm -hmm. Harrow Sweet and Harrow Delight. And Harrow Delight's another one you should try because mm -hmm. it's an earlier season, oh, a much cool. earlier season. That's one of our first ones, okay. maybe after summer crisp that we say. Harrow? Harrow. So H-A-R-R-O-W. And I think there's others in the Harrow series, but Sweet and Delight are the two that we have. And they will start to bear in their like third or fourth year, maybe, wow. um, whereas others might take to seven or eight years. And At also, least. I think it also made a difference. Like I, I think there was a phosphorus deficiency in that field uh, because uh, the pear production really kicked in after I ran the chicken tractor through there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was also just going to say that I'm, I'm planted, I planted standard pears, and I'm actually replanting my apple orchard that was dwarf and is now. Um, dying back and so uh, I'm going back to mostly standard trees altogether mm -hmm. because the dwarf rootstocks just aren't hardy on my farm. So. What makes a pear naturally precocious? 
It's just yeah. that. Ooh, what right. does that mean? I mean, well, besides precocious, being a great it's set of words. Sometimes plant even. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so precocious just means that it will start bearing fruit maybe earlier in its lifetime than average, right? So if, an av if on average your pear is going to start bearing in seven years, a, a naturally precocious one would be one that just will hopefully start bearing earlier in oh. its lifetime. So like I said, with those Harrow ones, we've been, we started to get, you know, I want to say three, four, five years to like get a little bit of fruit. So, so can you graft to, that plant to try and get that behavior yeah. from it? Or yeah. Well, it's, just, it's just that those varieties happen to have this characteristic, which is that oh. they start bearing a little earlier. And you find that with apples too, like, or with any, probably with any kind of fruit, right? Like some varieties might just tend that way, but I, we've really found that with those specific varieties of pears, that they will start bearing a little bit earlier than other varieties. It's another argument for the pilot and then scale up too, because I noticed that with my apples, and the apples that I'm now grafting onto the new rootstock are the precocious ones, just with even within I the variety. I just variety. love that somebody came up with that word for it. <laughs> yeah. A precocious tree. It's like a precocious kid. Starts yeah. Talking earlier, yeah. whatever. You first, yeah. and then you. I have a question about recommendations for short season um, fruits and berries. I'm actually out from Colorado, okay. and we have sometimes no more than a 90-day yep. frost-free season. Yep, yep. Um, and so anything I should cross off the list from your slide, Claire, or no, a I'm, star? I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> mine could be not. So our okay. last um, frost-free date in the spring is June 15th. And we will get, uh, we can get frost by September 15th. Same. So, yeah. And yeah. you'll have the advantage, may, I think, of maybe being a little drier. So yeah. that can be very helpful. Both currents are already in your area, too. So okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so uh, we can so talk after. But that whole list okay. is good for you, too, I think. And and there, I would also check out, um, I haven't done these, worked on with these yet, but the University of um, Saskatchewan has been doing a lot of work on bush cherries, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which are, already in a very cold, dry place. Um, so I'm curious about those. I haven't trialed them yet. Great. 